Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Caitlin and on this channel I upload all sorts of different types of content relating to true crime, education and psychology related topics. So if that sounds like something you'd enjoy and you haven't already, then please do hit that subscribe button and don't forget to turn on your little notification bell so you know whenever I upload a new video. And welcome back to day two of my true crime upload week. I'm so excited for this week. Like I said in yesterday's video, I've been planning this one for so long so I hope you guys are looking forward to all the content this week. For today's case we're going to be discussing one known as the Westport murders, also sometimes referred to as the Burke and Hare murders, so if you want to hear about this case then please do keep on watching, but before we get started I'm just going to zoom through my usual disclaimer that I like to include at the start of all my videos, just letting you guys know that I'm not claiming to be an expert in this case or any of the other cases that I cover over on my channel. I'm simply relaying the information I'm able to find myself through research of certain sources on the internet and because only certain sources are accessible to me it means I may get things wrong, leave things out or mispronounce things. I apologise if I do any of those things, I'm not trying to cause anyone any harm or an injustice, I'm simply working with the information that I have available to me. So with all that being said let's just go ahead and get started discussing the case of the Westport murders. So as I said, the Westport murders are also sometimes referred to as the Burke and Hare murders and this string of murders took place in Edinburgh, Scotland between 1827 and 1828. So just a quick preface before discussing the crimes themselves, it's important to understand sort of the historical context. So at the time it was known that there was a significant lack of cadavers that were available to medical schools and it had become a relatively common occurrence for these cadavers to be obtained through illegal methods. At the time the only legal means of accessing cadavers had been those provided directly to medical schools which were specifically the remains of convicted criminals. And going hand in hand with this, there had been a sudden reduction in the amount of executions occurring at the time. So because of this, there essentially became a cadaver shortage. And the criminal activity of those commonly referred to as body snatchers began to surge as these individuals would begin to sell these illegally obtained bodies in exchange for money. And this case is a prime example of how these body snatchers had the ability to escalate from just grave robbing to murder. Brendan Dykes Burke was born in 1792 in Ernie in the north of Ireland. Throughout his life he had jumped from trade to trade, never entirely settling on one career until he served as an officer's servant. In 1817 he left his wife and his children in Ireland and made a permanent move to Scotland where he gained employment in the Union Canal. It was here he met a woman named Helen M. Dougal and the pair soon married. I do apologise if I say that name wrong at any point, I really struggled to pronounce some of these names. And this was not his final form of employment as once he was in Scotland he once again jumped trades in numerous areas from labourer to baker, he did a bit of everything. William Hare was also born in Northern Ireland somewhere around the same time as Brendan Burke. He too emigrated to Scotland in order to gain employment as a labourer for the Union Canal. And not long after this initial move to Scotland, he moved specifically to Edinburgh, where he acquainted himself with a man referred to as Logue, as he owned a lodging house in Westport. Logue died in 1826 and Hare then soon married his widow, a woman named Margaret, who became Margaret Hare. And after her ex-husband's death, Margaret had continued to run the lodging house. And then in 1838, Burke and Mdougal had moved to Westport in Edinburgh, the same area in which the lodging house was located. It's not known whether or not Burke had previously encountered William Hare, but he had become acquainted with his wife Margaret on his previous trips to Edinburgh some years prior. And when Burke and his wife did move to Westport, he was introduced to William Hare and the pair of them soon became close friends. And prior to murder, Burke and Hare had collected and sold a body of a tenant in the lodging house who they had later claimed had died of natural causes. This tenant had been Donald, he was an elderly army veteran who at the time had owed the Hares around £4 in rent payments. When the body was discovered in the lodging house, the two men came up with this plan and they decided that following the burial they would remove the body out of the coffin and replace it with bark. 
And this is exactly what they did. They then took the remains to the Edinburgh University and sold the body to a man named Dr. Robert Knox, who paid seven pounds and 10 shillings for the cadaver to be used in his classes. But the two men soon realised that they would be able to make somewhat of a living out of selling bodies to medical schools because of this cadaver shortage, and they started to consider their options in how they could go about collecting these bodies. Grave robbers and body snatchers had become somewhat of a known nuisance in the area at the time, and so they knew that it would likely be a risky route for them to take if they chose to start digging up freshly buried bodies. And instead, the pair turned to murder. The first victim was a man named Joseph, who had been a tenant in the lodging house that the Hares ran. Hare had learned that this tenant had suddenly fallen rather ill, and so they decided to use his vulnerability against him. One evening, the two men had sat this tenant down and they fed him a significant amount of whiskey before then proceeding to suffocate him. Once again, they took the body to Dr. Knox and sold it for a significant amount of money. And for a short while after this, they continued to look out for any other sick tenants who would come into the lodging house as potential future victims in this gruesome scheme that they'd concocted. But as time passed and tenants moved in and out, there was no sign of any other sick tenants. And it was at this point that they decided to come up with a plan for them to lure their next murder victim in off the street. In early 1828, they met an elderly woman named Abigail Simpson. They invited her to stay in their spare room in the lodging house and offered to then take her back to her own home the following morning. And just as they had done with their first murder victim, they fed Abigail copious amounts of alcohol before smothering her. And when they went on to sell her remains, they made 10 pounds. And when the next victim was killed, it was Margaret Hare that had had a main part to play. She had been the one to come across a woman in the street and she'd invited her to stay in the lodging house in one of the spare rooms. When the offer was accepted, she then proceeded to get the woman intoxicated and then she called for her husband to continue on with the murder itself. Following this, the next attempted victims were Mary Patterson and Janet Brown, two women that William Hare had acquainted himself while he was in an area called Canongate. He'd invited the two women to come to the lodging house for breakfast, an offer which the pair had accepted. But not long into the breakfast, Burke and his wife, who had also been in attendance, had started to have quite a loud verbal argument. And because of this, Janet Brown had made the decision to leave the lodging house. She later returned in search of her friend, Mary Patterson, when she had assumed that the breakfast would be over, only to be told that her friend Mary had left with Burke. However, while Janet Brown had been absent from the lodging house, the couple had taken the opportunity to give Patterson a large sum of alcohol and she was added to their list of victims sold to medical schools. It is just worth me chucking in here that there isn't a lot of specific information known about each of these victims because of the time in which it all occurred, as I'm sure you can gather, but in a few sources that I did read, there were some claims that these two women, Mary Patterson and Janet Brown, had actually been prostitutes, and some sources even stated that some of the medical students who had seen Mary Patterson in one of their classes as a cadaver had actually recognised her because of this fact. They next lured in a young woman named Effie, who they'd found begging on the streets and invited her to stay at the lodging house. And she was also sold on to Dr. Knox. And not long after this, Burke found himself in the presence of a woman being arrested by the police. He proceeded to argue this unknown woman's case by claiming that he knew her, which in fact he didn't. And because of this, the woman was set free. And a few hours later, her body was sold to Dr. Knox. The MO of the next two victims differed slightly as they were an elderly woman and her young blind grandson. The grandmother had died after overdosing on painkillers, but Hare had then killed the young boy himself by breaking his back. And in exchange for these two bodies, the men had received eight pounds each. And then they'd killed a woman named Mrs. Osler, a friendly acquaintance of Burke's, and a woman named Anne Dougal, who had been a relative of Burke's wife. Next, they were contacted by a woman named Elizabeth Haldane. Elizabeth had previously been a tenant at the Hare's lodging house and when she found herself struggling for money, she returned to the couple and asked them if she could sleep temporarily in their stable. But she became their next victim, followed by her daughter Peggy, just a few months afterwards. 
The next victim they chose had been an 18-year-old boy named James Wilson, nicknamed by the locals as Daft Jamie. He was well known amongst the locals as he was intellectually challenged and he also had a severe limp. According to Hare and Burke, the young boy had strongly resisted their attack and it took the pair of them for it to be a successful murder. They sold the body once again, but before long, Jamie's mother had started to ask around in search of her son, worried for his safety. The following morning, Dr. Knox and his students had uncovered the body to be used as a cadaver in one of his classes, and some of them started to recognise Jamie. It's known that Dr. Knox had denied to his students that the cadaver was Jamie Wilson, but he strangely then started to dissect the cadaver beginning with his face, something which was rather unorthodox. And by the end of Dr. Knox's class, he had removed the cadaver's head and feet. Following this, the final victim of Burke and Hare had been a woman named Marjorie Campbell Doherty. She was approached by Burke, who had asked her to come into the lodging house as his mother was also a member of the Doherty family. But when he had been successful in luring her into the home, he became aware that two other lodgers named James and Anne Gray were already inside the building. So because of this, he then had to wait for the pair to leave. And when they did, later that same night, Burke then continued with his attack. The following morning, one of these lodgers, Anne, had returned to the lodging house as she believed she'd left her stockings in the home prior to leaving. But when she went back looking for them, she came face to face with Burke, who strangely refused to let her go anywhere near the bed where she had left them. She became suspicious, and then when James Gray had come to look for her, the pair had decided they would wait around the lodging house until they were alone, so they could then go and search the room where they'd stayed. As Anne had been sure that she'd left the stockings around the bed somewhere, they started their search here, and this is when they stumbled across Marjorie Doherty's body underneath the bed and they had immediately left the home and set off in the direction of the police station. But on their way there, they bumped into Burke's wife. When she asked them where they were heading off to in such a rush, they had informed her of their discovery and she had actually attempted to bribe them by offering them weekly payments of £10 in exchange for their silence. But much to her dismay, they refused and continued on their way to alert the police. By the time the police had arrived at the lodging house, Burke and Hare had already taken the body out of the house and had sold it to Dr. Knox. But when Burke was soon captured and questioned by the police, they found that his and his wife's stories didn't add up. Burke had told the police that Marjorie Doherty had left the lodging house at 7am that morning, but when his wife was questioned separately, she stated that the lodger had left the house in the evening time. Both Burke and his wife were then arrested on suspicion of the murder and the police then started to receive an anonymous tip telling them to search the classroom of Dr Knox at the Edinburgh University. And it was here they found Marjorie Doherty's remains, the identity of who was confirmed by James and Anne Gray. And the timeline of the murders spanning over the previous 12 months started to become clear to the authorities and William and Margaret Hare were then soon arrested. In November of 1828, a local newspaper had released a number of details regarding the known deaths, an article which Janet Brown had come across. She soon recognised the clothing being described in the article as belonging to her friend Mary Patterson, who she hadn't seen since their breakfast at the Hare's lodging house. But ultimately, because of the victims that they had chosen, there had not been a lot of substantial evidence to prove their guilt. Before long, William Hare was offered a deal. He would be granted immunity from prosecution if he agreed to confess to the murders and if he testified against Burke, a deal which he ultimately agreed to. As a result of the testimony he gave against Brendan Burke, Burke was sentenced to death in December of 1828 and he was hanged on the 28th of the following January. After he was executed, his remains were sent to the Edinburgh Medical College to be dissected during the student's studies. His wife Helen was released the following month due to there being a lack of evidence proving that she had any part to play in the murders, as well as Margaret Hare never being prosecuted. But the most shocking turn of events saw that Dr. Knox had not been prosecuted, despite him seemingly being somewhat aware of what had been occurring and as many people viewed it, he had been the one to provide a monetary incentive for the pair's murders. What seemed to play a huge part in his defence had been that in Burke's written confession prior to his death, he declared that Knox had never been made aware of where they were getting the bodies from. 
Not long after her release, Burke's wife Helen was attacked at her home by a group of outraged locals, but after this point, it's not known exactly where she went. Some had believed that she'd moved in with some family, while others believed that she'd moved as far as Australia to escape the public shame. William Hare remained in custody until February of 1829, where there were many rumours that claimed he had been spotted numerous times as a sightless beggar in London, but his whereabouts following his release were never confirmed. Dr Knox had remained in his teaching position for some time and was believed to have continued using local body snatchers as a means of collecting cadavers. But then in 1832, something called the Anatomy Act was passed, which allowed the ability for more cadavers to be supplied to medical schools in a legal sense, so this all changed. But that is where I'm going to end today's video. So as always, please do leave your thoughts down below. I hope you guys found this interesting and I'll see you guys tomorrow for another video. Thanks for watching. Bye.